So um, I have to get a picture of myself in a lab coat in, just so I look like a scientist. Uh, but this is kind of, this is what we do. Um, we're a unique multidisciplinary uh, facility. Um, we specialize in teaching right across campus and we work closely with industry. And we've become a, quite a major research center of the university with lots of EU funded um, projects going on at the moment. Um, so we have this transform CE, which is taking single use plastics and we're turning it into 3D printable filaments. Um, so this is quite nice. We're taking um, that, that process and working directly with the recycle centers um, right the way through the whole process. Um, our academic lead in the university is a Professor Craig Banks, who's a professor of chemistry. So we work right the way through to the, the chemistry side of things. Um, and then we're producing these, we've come up with the, the, the workflow and the development, and we've come up with this kind of process of taking these otherwise waste plastics and then turning them into recycled and recyclable filaments for, um, for print. Um, CERMAP is also our concrete printing. So we're using recycled concrete from demolished buildings and turning that into printable material uh, for things like street furniture, sculptures, um, garden planters, things like that. So we won't be building houses from it, but we will be building kind of smaller objects that, from that. And um, again, so it's really nice to be here as part of the textiles talk because the students who really engage with this technology from right across the university from day one have been textile students. Um, it was quite a surprise to us at first. Uh, we expected lots, you know, lots more interest from other backgrounds, but always every year. Um, and Georgina, who you had a talk from before, is one of our ex students. Um, they really engage with the technology and really kind of experiment and play with it. So we've got our textile students um, in, uh, engaged with the CERMAP project. So looking at surface finish, uh, kind of indentations and kind of print and patination for the concrete print as well. So it all, it all kind of interlinks and, and works. And we also have share repair as well, which is where we, um, we're working again, kind of recycling um, electronic devices, keeping them out of landfill, repairing them where we can. So it's all about digital skills right across the, 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 um, the whole of the kind of the economy and feeds into the circular economy as well. Um, the, some of you already been on the tour. There's two more tours, so we'll see the whole of Prince City and some of the new equipment we've got. Um, so a little bit about Prince City and what we do and kind of how we operate. Uh, I've been in the university. I joined the university about eight years ago, coming up for eight years now. Um, it was a commercial venture that kind of didn't really work out for various reasons. Um, one, one being, which again is kind of true for industry, is that the, there was a shortage of digital skills, digital knowledge. Students didn't really understand how to engage with the technology. So from, from that point on, we've had top-down um, support from the university, from the Vice-Chancellor right the way through, um, which has really enabled us to expand and um, add all of the new technologies that are available. We, we talked to industry and industry was saying that, you know, graduates are coming out. They say they know about additive, but they may know one process and one technology. So Print City, we have every major technology available to the students and we let the students have hands on. Um, we know some universities don't let students actually touch the printers and we do. We let them have hands on the printers. Uh, we don't care if they break them because we'll fix them or we'll show the students how to fix them. And we, we kind of want the full knowledge from, you know, the good and the bad side of it. Um, so we work, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Print City Network in a little bit. So this is a, where we work with local industry um, and individuals throughout the Greater Manchester area. And we provide, at the moment, we're providing free um, kind of work and consultation and collaboration with them as well. Um, knowledge Transfer Partnerships, MMU is one of the leaders in Knowledge Transfer Partnerships. So you can speak to myself if anybody's interested in that a bit later. Um, and we have international collaboration. We do work out in India. Um, we've been out to South Korea recently. Um, and we have other kind of, kind of fingers in many pies around the world. So uh, lots of people from around the world, are really, they really look to the UK um, to see what we, what we can offer in the kind of creativity and individual um, kind of mindset, again, what we always come back to, that kind of mindset. And so we, you know, we're working with South Korea, we were out there with LG and Samsung and all these companies that we think are, you know, kind of mind blowing, but they're very aware that they, they're very good at copying, they're not very good at innovation, and they see the UK as a real hotbed of innovation, which of course it is, and they see Manchester as a real hotbed, you know, they, they talk about the industrial revolution, 
Um, we were really surprised. We were treated like royalty in South Korea. They really, really uh, respect and admire Manchester. So it's quite nice to be able to be part of this. Um, we work with school groups as well. So starting with, with young age, uh, get school children in. And um, we also, CPDs and all this kind of things within the university and externally. And then we have this cross-campus um, multidisciplinary teaching, which I mentioned. We've changed the name of our master's course to Digital Design and Manufacturing. It's a bit easier to remember than um, industrial digitalization. And then sort of the outcome for this, all of this activity is digitally skilled workforce and industry for knowledgeable graduates. So this is, this is what we see as key to the kind of the future kind of British and global workforce. This kind of industry for knowledge where we're called Print City, we have a lot of 3D print equipment, but it's really about the whole digital skill and the digital mindset that the interconnectivity of all of this kind of equipment and what this means for industry. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we do and just point out for people who are new to 3D print um, with textiles that there's four main areas that we, we kind of identify. And just to give you a little bit of a, a kind of a, an overview, and we've already seen some of this today from Mark um, and uh, some of our other speakers, but we can, we've got basically the first kind of thing that people often see with 3D prints is this uh, interlock, ge interlocking geometry or chain mail. Um, and these forms can be printed as one uh, continuous fabric. So, you know, you've seen the examples that Mark uh, showed earlier, particularly uh, described that particularly well. Um, and then you, so you do need some kind of CAD skills here. Um, and you need, uh, you know, parametric that we've, we've um, seen some examples of this morning as well. So um, we'll come to some of, the, some of the kind of problems in that in a bit. Oops. Oh, my slides are going, not used to the Mac. Go back to two. Um, and then, so the other side of, the other way of creating a geometry would be to G-code to actually program the, the printer itself. So if we're working with the extrusion printers, with the uh, FFF technology, that we have control where we've got electric motors which are driving the print head or the extruder. And there's things like temperature sensors and flow, how, how much uh, material goes through that extruder at a time. So you can control all of this hands-on if you want to get into the programming language. And again, this, this, some people really like this kind of approach, um, and, but others, it's a, kind of a, it's a brick wall to some people. So it really depends you know, which flavor of these four kind of areas fits with your sort of process, really. Um, we can get more complex forms, gener uh, so we can do the parametric generation, again, like we've seen some examples this morning, uh, using Grasshopper. But we can see uh, just the example um, in red is a, if I just show what this is, oh, it's not working. No, sorry, that's for some reason not working on a Mac. There should be a transition there. The geometry, oh, if I just go back to it to talk about, the Geometry that you can see in red is very complex sort of pattern that, that's been made. The CAD model is basically a drawing of a rectangle that's been extruded by 0.4 mil. And that rectangle is taken into the print so software, so the slicing software of the, the printer. And then we give it zero wall thickness and zero top and bottom surface. And we've got a whole menu of infill um, patterns that we can choose that are built in. So the, the printer will not generally not print something in a solid form unless we tell it we want it solid so it will it will use less material internally so something that looks like a solid object is built with um these different patterns and we can we can kind of get into that as well Oops. um and then this is something else some work we started again about back in 2015 um we're looking at smart bandages and using some um, 3D printing to create, again, what would normally be 2D, 2D um, objects. So that's what this image shows and how we're working with the computer, we're working with fabrics and how we're working with um, simple designs. So this shows uh, some circuitry um, for a, what would be a bandage for um, helping people with uh, diabetes um, to help their wounds heal faster. And um, again, we can, we can sort of play around with the form a little bit. So, we, you know, we've gone with the Red Cross here. So we've got some kind of design freedom. 
Uh, we've also, uh, Professor Craig Banks has also developed a battery, a 3D printable battery using uh, graphene. So the idea would be that the, the patch would be self-powered um, as well uh, as we move on with that. Um, and then so uh, area three anyway, so this is drawn and generated using computer software, using this one's been drawn in Fusion 360. Um, so this is, this is the CAD, so the computer aided design sort of sign of it. So we've got the, the parametric chain mail, uh, we've got the G code, and then this is actually working directly with CAD software. So with our own designs, and then we can do things like um, add these volumetric lattice, lattices, which again, there's examples around and you've, you'll have seen some today. Uh, so we use some software called N topology for that, uh, as well as uh, Fusion 360. So this, we use Fusion as our kind of our, our tool of choice because it was designed from the ground up for people who wouldn't traditionally use CAD software. And it's got a very kind of accessible interface and, an, and a really kind of straightforward workflow. And it really opens up the possibilities to non-traditional CAD users and people who've hit that brick wall uh, when, they, when they approach these um, technologies in the past. And then we also have uh, scanning and photogrammetry so we can use digital cameras to, to capture objects. And we've got a various range of 3D scanners available to us. Uh, and then we, you know, we'll manipulate them within the CAD environment. So that kind of falls within the, that third category. And then four, uh, we've got the infill slicing. Oh, sorry, that was the slide I was showing you before. That's why it didn't work. I've jumped ahead of myself. So this is, this is what I was talking about before. So this is a simple CAD, the CAD model. It's basically a, a rectangle drawn in Fusion, extruded, and then um, dropped into the print software. And then if I show, so that's what it will actually print from that um, rectangle. This is the internal structure. And there's, um, I think there's nine variations in Cura. And we can basically play around with the scale, the size, the density, um, all of those things. So it's an almost kind of infinite chain, uh, you know, a selection of patterns that we can get. So right the way down from, you know, not, not being a completely empty print to 100% being a completely solid print. And we can change the infill right the way through and sort of experiment with this. So again, something we get a lot of the students playing around with and experimenting with. And you're going to get different, different thicknesses, different flexibility, different movement. So again, almost zero CAD skills here. We, anyone who can draw a rectangle um, on a computer can basically get to this level of kind of, you know, textiles kind of experimentation and output. Oops. Sensitive. I'm used to a clicker. Um, so some of the benefits of this, uh, we've got digital fabrication. So again, it's kind of new methods. Bespoke design and manufacturing, so we can really tailor things to, you know, if we incorporate this with a body scan, we can incorporate, we can kind of tailor this to the needs of an individual. And if we think before the Industrial Revolution, how we used to make things, you know, people would get things made specifically for them. And then the Industrial Revolution was great. Everyone could have something if it's one size fits all almost. And moving back into that bespoke um, and manufacturing um, kind of environment, also kind of feeds into the circular economy. Generally, if people are involved with the, the process, if, they're if they've got something bespoke and they've been involved with it, with the manufacture of that, they want to keep it longer, there's ownership, and people kind of feel that they want to keep, keep hold of that. So moving away from that kind of disposable society as well. Um, again, materials fit in with the circular economy. And then we've got the opportunity to locally manufacture things if we've got um, we, we saw a lot of this with uh, the lockdown, in the first lockdown, Print City was printing um, PPE equipment for the local hospitals and um, doing that kind of bridge manufacturing before the supply chain kicked in. So we saw, we've seen a real uptake in industry since lockdown because a lot of industry we were going out and speaking to were failing to connect the dots to see where they could use these, these processes and these applications. Um, but once they saw what was going on in lockdown and obviously um, supply chain issues and they needed something fast and they could they get it locally, then we've seen a real uptake in the kind of knowledge and understanding and application of, of all of this um, kind of digital manufacturing coming together. Uh, so locally manufactured is one um, side of it. And then unsupervised manufacturing, not, you know, some people don't really think about this when we talk about 3D print. Once we've sent that job to a printer or to a series of printers, we can walk away from it and we can carry on doing some other work. 
So traditionally, we would need a machine operator. We would need somebody operating this equipment. Um, so generally, we can, we can call this relatively unsupervised manufacturing. It means we can be doing other things. And if we have a, we have a chain of a, you know, a room full of these uh, manufacturing machines, then it, it kind of compensates for some of the speed issues. And then that file is also can be stored on the cloud. So you have a digital archive. I know we, we're kind of doing work around NFTs and things like that at the moment. So um, also, if then that needs to be, so local manufacturing, if, if I design something and want it to be sold in Australia, for example, it can be locally manufactured in Australia. So I can do away without that warehousing. I can do away with um, shipping and packaging and all that kind of stuff. So again, it kind of feeds into the circular economy and how we, how we kind of can look at um, selling and using these devices in the future. And some of the applications, um, so footwear, we've already seen. This is something we were talking about, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And, it, you know, it's, it's now, it's, it's, it's a thing. It, back then it was speculative and people were talking about it and there's development going on. But actually, we, you know, we can go into shops and buy, I think Mark's wearing some 3D printed trainers today showing off. Um, but, you know, we can, we can buy these things. But building this into, we, we all know Mo Farah, probably the runner, He's wearing um, 3D printed running shoes that, are, you know, they scan the feet and you produce this kind of bespoke, manufactured, lightweight, durable um, product for them. So sportswear, body armor, accessories, and then medical is, is kind of a big area what we see. And the crossover of all of these things, so medical, fashion, we've got prosthetics becoming fashion items um, and they can be bespoke and 3D printed. So this kind of mixing of all of these different what used to be separate, dis separate disciplines can all be kind of thrown into the same melting pot and talked about. Um, auxetics we've mentioned, and if anybody is interested in auxetics, come speak to Jack, our ex-student and currently works at Prince City, uh, is researchers in auxetics, um, and so he's kind of knowledgeable on all of that stuff. And, and automotive as well, we look at um, electric vehicles, self-driving vehicles, we want lightweight interiors. The, the, the dawn of, self-driving vehicles is going to change, radically change the interior of a car. The car is going to be maybe more like an old horse and cart kind of carriage. It's going to be maybe like a bar, like a cafe. So we're looking at interior design, we're looking at textiles, we're looking at fabrics, we're looking at fashion, and we're looking at advanced manufacturing, all coming together in the automotive space over the next few years as well. So this is something I'm particularly interested in. And I think, um, I think some of the people here, some of the work we've seen today, I can see how that can really be applied um, going forward for um, automotive. And then there's, you know, let's not forget there's lots of problems still. We're still very much in the early days. I mean, printing, 3D printing's been around 30 odd years now, but it's still very much in the early days. And I always compare it back to the compute, you know, the days of computers and personal computers and things. Uh, you know, computers came around the beginning of the 20th century. They were big, they were slow, they had limitations, um, they were expensive and they failed a lot. And then by the time we got to the sort of 1980s, people were buying, starting to buy home computers. And now, you know, we all have a, a supercomputer in our pocket. So, and the technology has moved on. So we're in that kind of, still in that kind of early phase of the technology. And this is where we, um, like we said earlier this morning, and uh, Jonathan very um, kind of said very well this morning about, it's about people who engage with the technology and people who engage with it and apply their ideas to it and really experiment. And again, you know, not just saying that because we're here today, it is the textile students and the fashion and textile students who really, really kind of do this and, we, and amaze us all the time. So um, there is time to manufacture as an issue. You know, it can be, it's not particularly fast, um, relatively speaking, unless you've got lots and lots of machines set up like a factory, you can compensate for that. Sometimes you need to manually stitch or weld these parts together. It can be labor intensive as well. So once the part's printed, you still have labor and process. So we get one-offs and bespoke and high-end, um, very good military and body armor, medical, that's kind of maybe okay. But that side of it's not gonna be in the high street shops kind of any time soon, we don't, don't foresee anyway. Not like shoes, um, which kind of more obvious kind of, uh, application. Uh, so there is still material limitations, so you know there's not as many materials available as there is with, with kind of just going out and getting some material for traditional manufacturing. This is changing rapidly though. Um, 
Form Labs are one of the print companies, printer companies that we work with. They have recently, their, their employment drive has been to employ chemists. Um, so they're really on the chemical side of it and on the material science side of it. New materials are coming out you know, practically every day now. So this is going to change rapidly. And as the new materials and the cost of the printers and the cost of the materials come down, it's, it's going through that kind of Moore's Law kind of effect again, where people are seeing the potential and the benefit and beginning to engage with it as well. Um, and then reliability is something, you know, reliability, durability, longevity, how these things last over time is still an issue as well with some of the materials. But what we're getting with the new nylons and the recyclable nylons um, that are coming out um, are kind of changing some of that as well. So it's, it's looking, there are still problems, but it is looking very positive uh, for the future. And then, so research, um, some of our research, we do a lot of research at the university, um, we, obviously, and we do a lot in Prince City. So circular economy is kind of key to everything we do. Uh, as it should be. Um, and this is an example of uh, SLA, or stereolithography, printing on textiles. So most of the textiles that we, you will see so far will be SLS, um, like Mark's um, printing, or what's called FDM, fused deposition modeling, or fused film and fabrication, um, uh, which is the extrusion printers onto fabrics. And we've been doing some experimenting, um, myself, Gary Buller and Jack, again, been doing some experimenting with the SLA printers and we're getting some really positive results. I was going to talk a bit more about this today, but we're still, we've got some ongoing research, we've got some really nice, exciting outcomes coming up and we will be publishing a paper on this um, in the near future. Uh, so it's really nice, but what we've got is uh, the SLS, uh, sorry, the SLA technology uses a liquid resin. And so we're getting a much better um, adhesion um, or absorption into the fabric using these uh, resins, um, which has given us kind of some, some nice uh, additional properties and some um, kind of durability qualities as well. Uh, so uh, this is ongoing. Um, and again, this is, this is kind of being applied uh, at the moment to research around smart bandages, which we will hopefully have some nice information for you shortly. And uh, also, uh, we've published a paper recently um, just about an overview of textiles in manufacturing. I, I think, I don't know whether these slides are going to be available to people afterwards, Jonathan. Uh, do people have access to these later? It's all being filmed. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, links, the links will be there for you anyway. Uh, again, some of the, just on the left there, we've got a poster of some of Jack's work, so Exetics, um, some work there. And so just a little bit of what we're doing. Um, various research going on. Um, it's a really active um, part of the university over in Prince City. And so, so we do publish quite a lot about this, but that's probably one that's um, more relevant to this audience at the moment. And then just to let you know a little about something that's coming up at Prince City Network. So if you're in the greater Manchester area, um, it's starting in autumn 22. We haven't finalized the date yet. Prince City Network will be running workshops uh, we're currently running workshops with companies. We've got architectural cohorts in at the moment, and we will be running a one that's um, targeted directly at textiles and man uh, textile manufacturers. So all the processes we're talking about today, <coughs> and some of the things I've just talked about in, in the, my presentation, will be covered. So basically, people can come in with zero knowledge, and they will leave with all of the knowledge and the, the hands-on kind of application for that as well. <coughs> And this is some of the things that will be covered. So it's embellishment, uh, fabrication, adornment, tooling, and then ultimately the, the wearables and how that works. So if you are interested or if you know people that would be interested in that, um, please get in touch. Uh, there will be um, social media and press releases before with dates and things, but I think it's scheduled for autumn. Is that right, Jack? Still autumn, isn't it? Yeah. So we're, we're aiming for autumn for that. And then I just wanted to finish off with this, which is maybe slightly unusual, but this is a little uh, lampshade that was made from an MP3 file, so a music file. Um, and it's been obviously 3D printed, life fitting. And you can see the, the image um, on the left is um, the, a photograph of the light actually in situ working. So I just wanted to kind of add the, you know, talk about we're here with digital, with 3D print, with textiles. We're actually 
once we've got a digital file, we can, we can sort of manipulate it and play around with it and expand. So any digital file we can transfer from one format to another. And with this process, we took a, an MP3 file, a music file, and we turned it into a lampshade. Um, now we can also play around with scale and material. So the other thing we did with this was then reduce this to much smaller and it was cast in silver and became jewellery. Uh, it was also printed off in other uh, materials and became buttons for, um, for, a, for a shirt or a jacket. And so it can, it, we can kind of start making digitally uh, manufacturable accessories, fashion and textiles accessories from things like photographs, digital photographs, from music files, from whatever the digital file is. So that was just something I thought I'd just kind of open, sort of, um, open some ideas up, hopefully. And um, I think I'm about done for time. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that, and hopefully that was useful. <laughs>